Uh, my name is Allison Green. I'm the manager of external exhibitions and public programs here at the Art Students League. Welcome to our live talk series. This is our last program of the calendar year 2021. Our great thanks to the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, whose generous support helps make this series possible. And fittingly, with this being our last program of the year, we have a very illuminating story to share with you tonight that comes from the League's own history. This program will introduce artist and League alum, George Morrison. In 1943, Morrison left his community at the Grand Portage Indian Reservation in northeastern Minnesota to attend the Art Students League. His next few years of study were made possible by two awards the artist received, and you'll hear more about that soon. I also have the great pleasure of announcing tonight's pre presenter herself. Um, our presenter is award-winning art scholar and museum leader, Dr. Patricia Maroquin Norby. She is the first full-time curator of Native American art at the Metropolitan Museum of Fine Art, a first in the Met's 150-year history. Dr. Norby's curatorial vision and exhibition strategies have been celebrated by the New York Times, PBS, Forbes magazine, Bitch Media, and she is described as a new voice in an old institution by the Santa Fe New Mexicans Pasatiempo. Dr. Norby previously served as senior executive and assistant director on, of the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, New York, and as director of the Darcy McNichol Center for American Indian and Indigenous Studies at the Newbury in Chicago. Dr. Norby holds her PhD in American Studies from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities with a specialization in Native American art history and visual culture, as well as an MFA in printmaking and photography from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her latest publication, Water, Bones, and Bombs, examining 20th century Southwest art production and environmental conflicts among native, Hispano, and white communities in the Northern Rio Grande Valley is forthcoming from University of Nebraska Press. Dr. Norby also brings extensive teaching experience to the Met, including a position as assistant professor of American Indian Studies at the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire, where she taught historical and contemporary Native American art history and culture at graduate and undergraduate levels. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Norby this evening. Um, before I begin, I'd just like to say thank you um, to Anki, Allison, Stephanie, Andrew, and others here at the Art Students League for all of your support with making this evening possible. I'd also like to acknowledge that um, the work of Jackson Rushing III, as well as Margot Fortunato Galt, who have done extensive work on, on George Morrison. Good evening, I'm Patricia Marquin Norby. I am Purapacha, and I'd like to acknowledge that as a Purapacha woman, I'm a guest here in Lenape Hoking. In February 2015, while recovering from major surgery, I was laid up in my Chicago apartment, which faced the southwest shore of Ininwewi Chigami, or Lake Michigan. Isolated for three weeks with only few occasional visitors, the lake became my daily companion. Unable to move my arms above my waist or lift more than a few pounds, I was still able to hold my iPhone at waist level while looking 26 floors down onto the lake shore. I decided one way to make my, make my way through the slowly passing time was to photograph the lake at least once a day. In what, what would be described or what could be described as hit, a Hitchcock rear window-like experience, the making of each photograph became a way to motivate myself to pass time and to progress through my own healing process. So the images that I'm showing you right now are all images that I took um, from my window um, onto the lake. Unlike Hitchcock's photojournalist L.B. Jeffries, however, I was not spying on my suspicious neighbors, but instead was acknowledging, interacting with, and responding to my most prominent, mo most mysterious neighbor of all, in Inwewe Chigami, Lake Michigan. The process of documenting the lake was not only visual, but also aligned my senses with the texture, temperature, sounds, and constant activity of this ever-changing body of water including its shifting colors, 
movements, shapes, reflections of light, and direct responses to the wind, sunlight, and the local environment. In his 1998 biography, written by Mar Margo Fortunato Galt, Ojibwe painter and sculptor George Morrison described his own interactions with and responses to Anishinaabewi Chigami, or Lake Superior, at his home on the Grand Portage Reservation. He stated, through my window at Grand Portage, I can see the lake change by the hour, from blue to yellow and rose. Dramatic things happen in the sky with clouds and color. A rough spot appears on the lake, on the water, way off in the distance, or very, very rough water starts toward the shore, or a streak of light illuminates the horizon. The ways I respond to these changes are both subconscious and perceptual. One of my notions in my imagination was to capture the infinite variations and changes of moods that pass over the lake at different times. I'm fascinated by the ambiguity, change of mood and color, the sense of sound and movement above and below the horizon line. Therein lies some of the mystery of my paintings. Morrison's description of Anishinaabe Beiwei Chikami, or Lake Superior's ambiguities, shifts in moods, changes in color, not only characterizes the lake's physical changes, it portrays a distinct personality. The lake as a living being, a sovereign, independent, deeply in influential individual. The lake is alive. Hello everyone, I'm Patricia Marco Norby, Associate Curator of Native American Art at the Met. It's my pleasure to be here with all of you this evening and to talk about one of my favorite artists, George Morrison, who for me has great um, personal significance. My personal and professional affinity for Morrison and his work began in 2003 when I was an intern at the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. At that time, I had the honor of shadowing my mentor, Truman Lowe, the renowned Ho-Chunk sculptor who served as curator of contemporary native art from 2000 to 2008. As an intern, I had the honor of shadowing Lowe, as well as other NMAI staff, to George Morrison's home and studio on the North Shore of Lake Superior in Minnesota. It was there that my long-term interest in Morrison's life experiences and art began. Tonight, I would like to share about Morrison's life in New York City, his transition from a regional landscape artist in Minnesota to become a major influence in the development of abstract expressionism, and also his deep connection to large bodies of water, a connection which began in rural Minnesota and which he carried with him throughout his life and career. For Morrison, the sounds, smells, texture, color, and, and light of water were home, were home, even when he was living and working over 1,400 miles away in New York City. For Morrison, just as a lake was a living being, so too was New York City, as he absorbed the energy, vibrations, and people of his surroundings. Born in 1919 in Chippewa City, Minnesota, 31 miles from the Grand Portage Indian Reservation and about two hours northeast of Duluth, Morrison's life and art were deeply shaped by his roots at Lake Superior and the powerful presence of water, what the artist would eventually describe as his magic. According to his biography, Morrison carried the magic of the lake and his home with him, both in spirit and literally, in a small jar in the form of stones, cedar, local tobacco prepared by his sister, and Chimayo earth from northern New Mexico. Um, one of the things I want to point out in this um, photograph of the church, and also the photograph on the bottom, is in the upper left of the photograph of the bottom is George's grandfather, um, also known as John George Morrison. And John George Morrison built, built the church um, that you're looking at, the St. Francis Xavier Church, which still is still standing on the North Shore of Lake Superior. Chimayo, originally the sacred site of Tewa Indians, is located 28 miles northeast of Santa Fe, New Mexico. 
El Santuario Chimayo was once and still is a holy pilgrimage site for New Mexico's Tewa and other Pueblo Indians who honored a sacred natural spring at that site prior to Spanish colonization. Relative to this natural water spring, the earth there is believed to have healing powers. In 1818, the Catholic Church built a chapel around the dirt well, and the site now attracts over 300,000 visitors per year, seeking the water and the earth's healing qualities. Morrison stated, I have a little jar of Chimayo earth. Chimayo is a town near Santa Fe. In the church there, off to one side of the altar, is a sacristy, a little well that goes down into the earth. A lot of people come there to get a handful of that earth. I suppose many people do that, non-Indians as well as Indian. They've heard about it because it has certain, a certain magical quality. I call it healing earth. I put some chimayo, chimayo, er, chimayo earth in my mixture, my magic. Morrison's magic earth as, and the well from which it is drawn is significant because it's of its close proximity to the natural spring honored by the Tewa peoples. The healing water gives the earth and thereby the people its magic. In other words, the water, the land, and the human experience are all inextricable. Understanding Morrison's own personal brand of magic is criti critical to interpreting the artist's perspective as well as his sense of openness and wonder throughout his life experiences, which presented both opportunities and challenges for the artist. Throughout the mid 20th century and beyond, Morrison's work has consistently been examined in alignment with abstract expressionism as well as native modernism, two movements which developed during the first half of the 20th century. On at least one occasion, Morrison would be turned away from art competitions featuring the work of Native Americans for working with non-local, non-traditional art mediums and materials, specifically painting, drawing, printmaking, and sculpture, as well as imagery and subject matter that was not considered traditional. Throughout his career, Morrison expressed a profound connection to specific geography, or as art historians David Penny and Bill Empheys describe as his, his own sense of place a point which I emphasize beyond the artist's aesthetic expression and was deeply impacted, I'm sorry, aesthetic appreciation and was deeply impacted by Ojibwe community values and their sense of responsibility to um, Lake Superior as well as uh, their history and oral um, origin, origin stories which are connected to Lake Superior. As we shall see, Morrison's distinct articulations to place grow and shift over time, but are consistently present both symbolically and then later directly through the use of materials which were shaped, shaped by or actually embodied water. Consider, for instance, that Morrison's early studies of shells and whale bones created in 1945 to 1950 while the artist was living and studying in New York full time and spending summers in Provincetown, Massachusetts, Morrison would explain these images in context with his relationship with water while comparing his experiences at Lake Superior. He stated, Provincetown is like Grand Marais, Lake Superior, the Atlantic Ocean, the big waters. I have an affinity for big water. I have always felt good being near the water because of being born right near the lake. My work was going toward abstraction, but I didn't jump into it. I was subconsciously feeling my way along. By this time, all of my paintings were studio paintings, painted inside, all imaginative. I still began with subject matter, a whalebone, a piece of driftwood. Then I built the composition around these. Whether beachcombing or painting or making friendly connections with members of Provincetown's Portuguese fishing community, the artist's subconscious feeling his way along again and again would be saturated with the smell, sound, or touch of water, a reference to his home place. This powerful theme is one that played out repeatedly in his aesthetic expressions throughout his life. To fully understand Morrison's contemplative work, we must understand his life experiences. In 1928, at age nine, he was sent away from his home at Grand Portage to live at an Indian boarding school in Wisconsin, in Hayward, Wisconsin. He was there for nine months of the year away from his family. In 1929, a pain in his leg 
sent him to the Gillette State Hospital for crippled children in, in um, Minnesota. And he was there for 14 months and was diagnosed with ter tuberculosis. In 1930, hip surgery on both legs, um, on his one hip, um, but he had casts on both his legs for eight months. So if you can imagine a child, um, maybe 11 years old, um, completely confined to a bed <clears throat> for eight months. Morrison spent the time reading books, working with art materials, and then he also um, had a lot of other experiences interacting with the children in the hospital, but also meeting celebrities like the heavyweight boxer Jack Dempsey. In 1931, he returned to school in Grand Marais and um, had a permanent limp. limp. That's something that we, he would have for the rest of his life. And also, often described his own body as being on an oblique angle. This is something that he describes as also affecting um, his work process as well, working on his canvases or surfaces from left to right um, at a particular angle, which later develops into his horizon line. And these types of physical um, characteristics of people is something that I'm actually quite fascinated with. Um, in my book, Water, Bones, and Bombs, I also study the work of Georgia O'Keeffe and analyze her um, loss of eyesight. Uh, many art historians have described O'Keeffe's loss of eyesight as beginning much later in her life, um, in her 60s, 70s, but actually O'Keeffe suffered from myopia beginning um, at a very young age, and which got worse in her 40s, and she refused to wear eyeglasses. So if any of you are nearsighted in the audience, you might understand O'Keeffe's paintings a little better because they're big blurry images large shapes with lots of color, um, and then, or, and those are her landscapes, or they're extremely close up, the way that someone who has, um, who's nearsighted would, would need to see things. In 1934, um, he starts high school, and he also starts taking classes at, as a teen. He begins carving with wood, and then he also starts taking classes in uh, manual and industrial art courses, which he ends, ends up excelling at. And wood becomes another um, continuous medium that he works with throughout his life. In 1938, he graduates um, high school, and he's the first person in his family to, get a, to earn a high school diploma. After he graduates, he enrolls at the Minnesota School of Art. And, um, he starts taking classes in, in art and design. Um, so he's taking design, color, and life drawing classes. So these are a couple pictures of Morrison as a young man. The one um, with the chair that he, cre that he made in his uh, shop class, which I think is actually, um, suggest it suggests how some of his paintings are actually spatially structured later on when you look at them. And then the picture on the right is with some of the students at the Minnesota um, School of Art, Minneapolis School of Art in 1943. And so this idea of him being away from home again and again, so first as a small child in the hospital, creating art, um, expressing himself creatively there, away from his home, away from his family, and then again in high school, um, this happens um, when he's away from his family, attending classes at Grand, Grand Marais High School. And then once again, when he is um, attending classes at the Minnesota, Minneapolis School of Art. So this is a particular pattern or theme that continues throughout his life. In 1939, he suffers another hip surgery. And this time, as, as a teenager, he's in the hospital for four months. In 1942, he creates this painting, Duluth Corner, and begins um, winning awards for his art um, in just basically local competitions and, and starts exhibiting locally. One thing I want to point out about this painting is that it organizes spatially um, Morrison's work. So he's organizing his surfaces I guess we could describe them in planes or triads. And so when you look at, you look at the image, you can see how it's divided almost exactly in three sections. And this is something that um, continues throughout his work. You can also see um, in this painting the beginning of what, what is later, he 
what later becomes the horizon line for him. So now he moves to New York. And after graduating from the Minneapolis School of Art, he then comes to New York. He wins the Ethel Morrison Vanderlip Traveling Scholarship of $500. And that scholarship was, um, was to encourage artistic development in, in students. He buys a one-way ticket to New York City, has one cardboard suitcase and his hat, and he arrives via train. And then from 1943 to 1946, he attends classes here at the Art Students League. And so I love this, um, this wonderful <laughs> document. Thank you to Stephanie for locating this document for me. I was, I was curious, I'm guessing now that your membership cards or enrollment cards here are now digital, unless you have a hard copy. Um, still have those, but I love this. I love this um, card. There's so much information just in this one document. So we know that his name, although we call him George Morrison, it's John George Morrison, just like his grandfather who built the church. He's living at 15 Leroy Street, and so I did a <laughs> I did a little Google map to see where this is, and uh, it's the building. It's the it's the more rose-colored building on the left. And so he would have to walk um, 27 minutes to get back and forth to the Art Students League. And you know, thinking of him and thinking of his health and thinking of his limp and the issues that he had with, with motion and his body, um, this was a walk that he took every day. And I'm sure that he walked all over the city um, just to absorb all of the energy and sounds and um, people um, that he was very interested in. I want to go back to the card and look at all the different addresses for George. He's first in New York City. He, his first address is in Grand Marais at Route 132. And then he eventually moves to Duluth, Minnesota. So I love that this card documents his movement around the world. But also, I enjoy looking at the different classes he was taking, painting, life drawing. And he's working directly with Morris Cantor, which I'll talk about a little bit later and also the um, documentation of his membership. And then he, I, it looks like he stopped paying around 1947 and um, is dropped from membership around 1948. What's interesting too about this card is at the bottom it says deceased for seven, April 17th of 2000. And uh, I was looking at other cards in the collection and they don't have this on there, but on Morrison's it does. Does anyone know where this is? Or has anyone passed by here or have any descriptions of this place? No? So while living and working in New York City, um, you know, he's a young man. World War II is just beginning. And New York is now replacing um, Paris as the capital of the art world. Um, and all of this is key to the development of George's aesthetic expression and his experience in the world. He's, you know, part of this fast-paced, fast, -paced, fast um, you know, changing scene. And just to get, put it a little into perspective, the population of Duluth, Minnesota, where he was going to school, um, was about 100,000 in 1943. And in 1943, the population in New York City was 12 million. So if you can imagine this young man who had been away from home but confined, never really had much freedom because he was always healing from some type of surgery. But going from Grand Portage, which is an extremely um, small community, then going to Duluth with you know, a pretty big population, and then coming here, like all of these changes much has, must have been very exciting for him. So he starts taking figure classes with Morris Cantor. And Morris encourages personal expression and enthusiasm in, within George, as well as all of his other students. But he really emphasized rich, rich, bold color, texture, abstract design, and also structuring, um, structural composition. So these are all things, these are all characteristics that, that you see in Morrison's work as he develops further as an artist. But one thing that we did um, do 
um, earlier when I came to the Art Students League was we visited the studio, we went around the corner to see exactly where uh, George was studying with Morris Cantor. And so going into that studio um, was quite an experience because it's, it's so multi-sensory. It's not only visual, and I think that that's the one thing we think about when we think about art. We think about it being visual. We talk about the images we see, um, or maybe we talk about the texture. But just walking into that space reminded me of being art school in art school in Chicago and all the wonderful smells, the, you know, the paint, <laughs> the chemicals, all of those things that are just so exciting about being in, in an art class at that time. So while he's in um, here at the Art Students League, he's making a lot of friends. He's reading a lot of books. He also develops a love for jazz and also different types of ethnic foods. He also writes for the League, the uh, publication for the Art Students League. Um, we know of at least one uh, article that he wrote on his, his concerns or his critique on, on the commercialism of art during this time period. During his second year, he spends a summer in Provincetown where he starts making even further connections, but also starts connecting with the Portuguese fishing community at Provincetown, a community that he described to Mar Marco Fortunato Gold as a community that he felt like he could identify with. And so there's you know, lots of meaning there for him as well. There's also, again, the connection to the, la or to the ocean that he compares to the lake, as I shared earlier. He spends a lot of time at the Cedar Street Tavern. He starts hanging out with, um, a little bit later on, he, he goes away for a while and he comes back to New York City, but later on he starts hanging out with Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, Franz Klein. So some of the you know, big names from, from this time period and along with abstract expressionism. In 1948, he has um, his first big show with Willem de Kooning at Grand Central Moderns. And by this time, he, he's pretty open about that he, he sees um, cubism, surrealism, as well as abstract expression, all of these things are starting to really create his own sense of flavor in his work. And this is an image um, with George Morrison and Harold Jackson at his opening um, with a painting, Driftwood, which, which later is, um, it becomes an award-winning painting for him. And so he becomes known for collecting driftwood, and he starts collecting in Provincetown pieces of wood that he finds fascinating, not only for their shape, but also their texture. Texture becomes a big um, aesthetic expression for him in his paintings, and then later his wood collages. And so he starts storing all of these pieces of wood, driftwood. From 52 to 54, he wins two prestigious awards. He wins a Fulbright to France. He also wins the John J. Whitney Foundation Fellowship and spends a year in, in France. So um, Jackson Rushing III, who's an art historian, describes Morrison's horizon line as beginning with this painting, Sun and River of 1949. And that's because of the way that this painting is, is divided and then also the that line across the top, almost to the top of the painting there. And I argue that Morrison's horizon line, or his way of looking at, and, um, looking at space on his surfaces, um, and the way that he works with his surfaces, organizes his space, um, began earlier. So I think it began much earlier with other works. And you actually see that in the shell paintings that I, um, shell and whalebone images that I saw, showed you earlier, as well as his, as his student work here at Art Students League, he'll often have a figure drawing and then there'll be marks toward the top of the right-hand side of um, his images. But then he talks about that moving from, from left to right. So there's something about that area in the upper right corner that again and again he emphasizes that space. So again, organizing his um, space, dividing up dividing up his surfaces, and he starts, um, starts inserting these kind of um, biomorphic forms in his work inside of the space. This is one of my um, favorite works of his. It's at the Jocelyn Art Museum because I think that it, it really, it strongly demonstrates a number of the qualities or his magic. So you not only have the, the space divided as he typically does, 
um, in thirds. But then you also have this line quality working throughout, throughout his, um, the space and connecting these biomorphic forms. And so I just want to go back here. Jackson Rushing writes about um, George's use of line to fill space um, in all of his work. So he's building up surfaces through line and these intersecting lines. So another thing that I'm really fascinated about in uh, his time here at the Art Students League is this tension, this relationship that he begins to develop, not necessarily personally, but professionally with Peter Busa. So as many of you might know, Peter Busa is part of the Indian space painting um, I guess movement or genre, and along with Steve Wheeler as well as others. And so what's interesting about that is, um, is that art historians describe the Indian space painters as paying homage to indigenous people for their contribution to the different abstract forms that they're now creating in their, in their paintings. Um, and so in this, in this uh, kind of interesting way, Busa and Wheeler, they're creating the Indian space. But Morrison is also creating Indian space, but of his own flavor. So he's carving out the, his, own, his own niche, his own way of expressing himself aesthetically and moving away from you know, what, what most people at this time in the 20th century are labeling as um, Native American art. So there's a lot of interesting parallels between um, Morrison and Busa. Their images start to echo one another, and these are two, um, they're a little bit far away in terms of dates, but I was interested in how they both have these totem-like shapes um, in them, and the way that their spaces are, they organize their space. They also are at the Art Students League, their members of the Art Students League, um, our memberships overlap in time. Although Busa leaves the Art Students League, let's see, he leaves in, I think, 1943, and then he comes back in 1945. And so they're actually interacting at that time. They know each other, they, they're interacting with one another, but there's actually, I've been reading uh, Morrison's biography and other works about him as well as Busa, and I haven't found anything other than um, exhibition, um, pamphlets, and other announcements that include both their names. In winter of 1946, this is very interesting, um, the Art Students League puts out two um, editions of the League. And what's really fascinating about this is that in one copy or one edition, Peter Busa is doing an interview talking about his work as well as abstract expressionism, but his, his views on abstract expressionism and also Indian space. And then Morrison is writing a critique on all of similar issues as Busa. And although Morrison is five years younger than Busa and doesn't actually have the savvy or sophisticated language um, that Busa does, he's actually um, critiquing in the art world in the same way as Busa is. So I just find this particularly fascinating that they both are um, featured in these two, two editions. They both are in a number of exhibitions together. So at the Whitney, they're con consistently in exhibitions there. And then what's also fascinating is that they both end up, they spend a lot of time in Provincetown, and then they also end up at the University of Minnesota right at the same time. So they both are faculty, fine art faculty there as well, and they're showing in exhibitions there. And then they both, um, teach there until the 1980s. I believe uh, Busa stops teaching at University of Minnesota in like 1983, and then Morrison, the year after Busa, they both retire, and they both spend um, a, a lot of time in Minnesota after that. So Morrison's um, own form, his biomorphic forms, the way that he's organizing canvas, starts to depend almost completely on color. And what's exciting about this transition, this is after he spent time in Paris. He went there on a fellowship, as I said earlier. He starts to organize on, according to texture, space, and then 
bold color. So this is part of his one-shot series that he did um, in the 60s after, after living in Paris, where he would paint directly from the tube onto the canvas um, surface and then just very thick impasto-like um, layering and textures of this work. So I've actually seen this work in person and it's quite stunning. The, the image here doesn't, doesn't um, it's not as vibrant as when you see it in person. It's one of his larger works. He did some, some large paintings and this is one of them. And just the energy of this, often Morrison would stay up all night drinking coffee and then doing a series of one-shot paintings. His goal was to do one painting a night at this time. It's at this time also that he meets Hazel um, Belvo, his second wife, and she, he also has um, a poodle that he starts bringing to the Art Students League quite often. He's still hanging out with Morris Cantor, socializing with people. People start to get to know his poodle very well. And then he um, actually he meets Hazel not long after in, when they're both at, in a, um, working and studying in Ohio. And so she talks about this painting in an interview, and she talks about his one-stop series, that um, they meet one night, and when he's teaching an art class, which he was late for, and then they um, have, have a couple drinks together, they go home, and she meets his poodle, and then she um, comes back the next day, and he presents her with a paint, not this particular painting, but a painting much like this, and he says, I did this last night, and it you know, was basically for her. Um, so it's quite incredible the level of energy, creative energy, that he had throughout his life, throughout his career. He goes from the one-stop um, series, then further develops his Horizon Line, which, which becomes his signature series. And so this, I love this because I think this is pulling all of the elements together. This is like the point where all of everything he's learned over time, everything that he's practicing um, comes together both aesthetically but also personally. He's dealing with a lot of health issues, he's returned to Minnesota, he's back home, he's now, he now is working in um, his Red Rock studio right on the shore of um, Grand Marais, and he starts working on this, um, this series, the Horizon series, the Horizon Line series. And he's also switched now to acrylics. And part of this is because he was diagnosed with Castleman's disease and can no longer work in oils. So he's working completely in acrylics. He's working on much smaller surfaces. And for some reason, he's not selling his work um, or showing his work at this time. And Hazel tells the story of how she grabbed a bunch of his paintings at one point, shoved them into a paper bag, and starts taking them around to different studios and galleries to see if people will show them or, um, or buy them. And that's a story that I, I heard Hazel tell when I was an intern and working with my mentor, Truman Lowe, and we visited Hazel, and she talked about how she shoved the paintings into a paper bag and went to town without George knowing about it. <clears throat> so remember all the driftwood I mentioned earlier that he was <laughs> collecting over the years? Hazel talks about um, all, of, all the stuff he had in his studio and how she went through and organized everything. And so he finally starts working with the, the wood and making these gorgeous collages of driftwood. And again, you see the way that he's describing or dividing the space. He's also creating, there's the horizon line across the top, as you could see. And he's working with something that he loves, something that's been touched by water, something that contains the smell, the texture. If you've ever had driftwood in your hand, you know that it's not just the wood anymore. It's now, it's now has a salty or watery smell. It now has the texture of water um, smoothing it down over time. It now has different colors um, within the wood. And so he's using that wood and now creating these um, wonderful driftwood murals. And so um, I'm really honored to be here to talk about George's work because it just, uh, his work touches me personally. You know, someone who also had surgery, was laid up for a time, my only companion was the lake, 
um, and then coming to New York from the Midwest and just thinking about what that was like for him. Um, all the changes, the sights, the sounds, um, everything, it's just incredibly exciting. It's also, it's also scary for someone who comes here from a rural community um, much like I have. And in just a couple years ago, I was invited to give a talk at the Tweed Museum um, in Duluth. My close colleague um, and dear friend, Carissa White, um, is a curator there. She's Anishinaabe. She's also from Grand Marais, like George. And she invited me up there, and she said, We're, I, I came a day early. We're going to spend some time together as friends. And she said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to see George's home. I want to go see where George grew up. I want to see um, you know, anything about George. So we spent a day driving along the North Shore of Lake Superior. We visited her aunt, um, who also knew George and his family. We drank tea with her. And um, we just spent the whole day talking, talking about art, talking about George, talking about my friend's um, life and family up at Grand, Grand Portage um, Reservation. And we spent a lot of time looking at the lake. And this is a video that I took of that day. I'm not the best videographer. Thank you.